Hi, everybody. Thank you so much for coming. I'm so excited you're here. Um, for those of you who don't know me, my name is Rachel Schrader. I'm Vice President of Clinical Care and Education at PPMD. I'm a nurse practitioner by training. And to tell you, oh my goodness, we're starting off really strong. Um, to tell you I'm excited about this session is an understatement. Um, I think that one of the things that PPMD does really, really well is thinking about Duchenne um, as a spectrum disease, but I think that sometimes we miss the mark when it comes to talking about Becker. And so often when we think about dystrophinopathy, we think more about Duchenne and turning Duchenne into a Becker, which is not the best language to use. Um, and we don't spend enough time talking about Becker and men living with Becker and different challenges that they may face, medical, social, whatever the case may be. Um, so this is the first time that we have had a dedicated session to Becker muscular dystrophy. So I'm just really excited that you all took time um, away from some of the other sessions that are going on to join us. So we're going to go through a little bit of a journey um, and we're going to focus tonight on clinical care in Becker. So we've got some spectacular panelists, all of whom are much smarter than me, and they're each going to touch on a different component of Becker clinical care. And that's going to set us up for another conversation tomorrow about emerging research in Becker. So I'm going to shut up and hand things over to Dr. Sue Apcon, who is a rehab physician at Children's Colorado, and she's going to get us started. Thanks, Rachel, um, uh, and thanks for uh, the invitation to speak. Um, uh, I am not Eddie C. Smith from Duke <laughs> University, um, which is what it says up on the slide. I'm uh, Susan Apcon. I'm a rehab physician at Children's Colorado. Uh, these are the joys of uh, the era of COVID, um, and so I'm uh, pinch hitting for Dr. Smith, who uh, I wish well uh, if you are watching this uh, live, Eddie. So. Um, uh, uh, this afternoon, um, I'm just going to go over this quick, brief outline. Um, we're going to talk a little bit about the definition of Becker muscular dystrophy. We talk a lot about Duchenne, especially in the context of uh, this conference, but we're going to dive a little bit deeper into, um, into Becker uh, and really describe, Rachel just used the term dystrophinopathy. People stumble over that a bit. Um, we're going to talk about what that actually means, talk a little bit about the differences and similarities between DMD and BMD, and then some neuromuscular considerations. That's what I'm going to focus on today um, is some of the neurologic issues uh, and some of the manifestations. And we have some experts that are going to talk about physical therapy, the heart, uh, and someone way smarter than me is going to be talking uh, about the genetics of it. Uh, I'll touch on it, but uh, we're going to hear from Nikki, uh, who's going to really be able to expand on that. Uh, and then finally, uh, I will briefly talk about emerging therapies, but as you heard from Rachel, um, there's going to be a session on that, and so I'm going to refer people to that for a much more in-depth conversation. So the history, um, uh, thank you to Dr. Smith for putting uh, some cool pictures uh, on the slide. And what you see here is back in the 1800s, the mid-1800s, is when uh, Dr. Duchenne described uh, Duchenne muscular dystrophy, the classic picture of someone with a waddling gait, big calves, uh, and the loss of ambulation and early death. It wasn't, though, until the mid-1900s, um, uh, 1950s, uh, that actually Dr. Becker described a much more mild, still X-linked uh, condition uh, and defined Becker muscular dystrophy. So, and you heard Rachel just talk about that. When we talk about Becker muscular dystrophy, we oftentimes think about it as the mild form of Duchenne. Well, if you are a parent or you are a person with Becker, you may not consider yourself as having any mild condition. Uh, and in fact, it actually could be as severe as what we think about as the classic type uh, of Duchenne muscular dystrophy. What we're talking about, though, is a reduction of the dystrophin protein. So you'll hear the term dystrophin over the course of the weekend, and, and many of you have, uh, have, uh, are quite familiar with that term. Um, dystrophin meaning that protein that is instrumental um, in the stability of the muscle cell itself. Uh, and when you have a lack of, when you have no dystrophin, you have Duchenne dystrophy, and you have a much more progressive condition. When you have Becker-type muscular dystrophy, you have some dystrophin. It's not the, the normal amount, and it's not the normal size, but you have some of the protein. And what you're seeing here on the right side of your screen is a demonstration of um, of uh, uh, muscle biopsies looking at, um, or, or, sorry, uh, you're looking at um, Western blot 
looking at how much dystrophin is present. So if you look at the slide, you see one, two, three, five columns. And column one is Becker muscular dystrophy. And what you can see, if I have a pointer, yes. So what you can see here is presence of dystrophin. Now in three, this is normal. This is someone without any muscular dystrophy at all. So this is a normal amount of dystrophin. What you see in lanes one and two is actually the presence of dystrophin, but not the normal amount. In lane four, what you see uh, is an, a complete absence of dystrophin. And in lane five, you see a little bit. So the two on the right uh, are someone with Duchenne muscular dystrophy, and the two on the far left are, um, are more characteristic of Becker. So presence of, but not normal amounts of dystrophin. So we historically used the loss of ambulation as a marker or a definition helping us to define Becker muscular dystrophy. So in Duchenne, we would say a boy lost the ability to walk by 13 years of age. And then we use this term intermediate muscular dystrophy. And those are boys who lost the ability to walk between 13 and 16. And then if you lost ambulation or lost the ability to walk after age 16, we'd say you have Becker muscular dystrophy. Well, that's great when you think about historical information. But we're in, in a completely new world, right? So we have the use of corticosteroids. Not so new. We've been using it for about 20 plus years. So the use of corticosteroids is associated with prolongation of walking, sometimes walking beyond 16 years of age. So we don't normally say a boy has Duchenne and then we convert them to Becker. Um, so we have to t use that, um, uh, that information to help inform the definition. Um, we also have kids on disease-modifying medications. So some of the exon-skipping drugs may help to prolong ambulation. And if so, then again, um, we're seeing ambulation beyond 16 years of age. So in my clinic, we don't say that you start out as having Duchenne and you convert to having Becker. We still say you have Duchenne, but you are on a disease-modifying drug like corticosteroids. It's also not helpful to say loss of ambulation after age 16 when you're talking to a three-year-old or a four-year-old. So if you are a new family, uh, a new parent or new grandparent of a three- or four-year-old, we have no idea when that child is going to lose ambulation. So to say that they have Duchenne or Becker uh, isn't particularly helpful in the context of that new diagnosis. So it's also a little bit confusing um, in that um, if you look at your bill at the end of the day from your insurance company and you look at the ICD-10 code, it will say Duchenne or Becker. Or Duchenne or Becker. It doesn't distinguish between the two, which makes it incredibly challenging um, to even, from a research standpoint, try to figure out. So if we searched in our EPIC healthcare system uh, for a diagnostic code to try to distinguish between Duchenne and Becker, we don't have that ability because it's the exact same code we're looking at. So in our clinic in Colorado, and I know because Eddie put these slides together, at Duke Children's Hospital, we use the term dystrophinopathy. So dystrophin, right, that's the protein in the muscle that is missing or in reduced amount. And apathy just means a problem with whatever we're talking about. So in this case, it's a problem with dystrophin. Um, and what you can see here is that it is truly a continuum. In our clinic, we have boys, from a genetic standpoint, we believe to have Becker-type dystrophy. Nikki will talk about this. Yet they're acting more like a boy with Duchenne. Difficulty getting up of, off the ground at five, six years of age and the loss of ambulation at a very early age. On the far end of the spectrum, we have men who are in their 60s who are still ambulatory. So our term dystrophinopathy helps to encompass all of our boys and men. What I shared earlier um, um, uh, uh, today with someone was uh, in, in my clinic, when I'm seeing a child, I will describe them. So I will say that they are a 14-year-old with a dystrophinopathy related to a deletion of exons blank through blank. Um, I may include the term in frame and out of frame. Nikki will talk about that. And they're on corticosteroids. So I'm creating a little bit of a picture in my mind without saying they have Duchenne or they have Becker. It really reflects the fact that, in my mind, there's a continuum. 
So here's a little bit about the differences between Duchenne and Becker. You can see the incidence is different. Much more common to have Duchenne than Becker. Elevated CK, so that is a marker of muscle breakdown. In Duchenne, we're talking about 20,000, 30,000, 40,000. In the setting of Becker, it's in the many hundreds to thousands, not tens of thousands. They can have joint contractures. That's something that we see in Duchenne and Becker. So tightness in the ankles or the hamstrings. They can develop a scoliosis in Becker, but that would be in the more severe um, end of the spectrum. Typically, people who are walking have much less of a, uh, an incidence of scoliosis or a curve in the spine. The thing that is in common, it, it's actually very common in the setting of, of, of Becker, and we're going to hear um, a little bit more about that today, is cardiomyopathy or heart involvement. It is the primary cause of mortality in men with Becker muscular dystrophy. Um, this is a slide that I, uh, that I Eddie, took um, from a manuscript uh, that was published in 2019. And I, I re recognize that it's small, but this is just to show uh, that the age of onset of various cases, so this was a case series of seven. You can see that the onset ranged from, uh, you know, from four, to 17, you can see the levels of CK involvement, cardiac involvement, and even the cognitive behavioral changes. And they vary. So within the setting of Becker, there is a, quite a variation. I threw this slide in because I think when you are a parent, when you are a grandparent, when you are a person with Becker muscular dystrophy, you, you think a lot about the heart. You also think a lot about walking. We talk about loss of ambulation. Um, this is a large Italian study, probably one of the largest studies of uh, boys and men with uh, Becker dystrophy. This encompassed 69 uh, boys and men um, that were between ages 6 and 69. And what you can see here, of that entire cohort, only three of the um, participants were full-time wheelchair users at 18, 47, and 60 years of age. What you could also see from this cohort were those that had deletions around 51 were much stronger or had a more mild uh, manifestation than those who had deletions around exon 45. There was another study uh, that was out of the Netherlands, and I'll just uh, read this quite uh, quickly. Uh, this group, uh, there were 30. First symptoms were a mean age of 12. Uh, mean age of 30, they were still walking stairs walking with an aid at the mean age of 41, um, and uh, only eight of the 30 were wheelchair dependent at the mean age of 54, at 54. There are also some cognitive behavioral differences between Duchenne and Becker. Um, the, um, uh, the intellectual disability, so boys with Duchenne on average have a IQ of about one standard deviation below the mean. We don't see that difference in Becker muscular dystrophy, but we do see learning disabilities. Uh, about 50% of boys with Duchenne will have a learning disability of some sort or another, and in Becker it's a little bit less at about 30%. There are some specific learning um, and behavioral differences, autism um, uh, spectrum in about 10%. Attention um, issues at about 35%, and uh, obsessive compulsive uh, in another group of people. Um, the, uh, there's a lot of work, and I, I want to call out the work of PPMD um, because they're doing a lot of work right now on looking at the um, cognitive behavioral manifestations in Duchenne. I would say Becker um, uh, is going to be important, and really understanding some of the genotype, phenotype, and also some treatment. So stay tuned for that. I think we're going to be hearing a lot more about that in the coming years. Um, briefly, neuromuscular considerations. So as I think about taking care of a patient with Becker in my clinic, I want to think about them in terms of their age and stage, the severity in which they are presenting. So I'm going to treat a 15-year-old um, a who um, has very mild symptoms very differently than a 15-year-old who has very severe symptoms. We will consider the use of corticosteroid, prednisone, or deflazacort in the case of someone with more severe manifestations, severe weakness. Um, pulmonary function testing um, uh, is going to be important as it is in Duchenne. Uh, so we will have our pulmonologist, our respiratory therapist doing pulmonary function tests. Uh, close cardiology follow-up. I will defer to my colleague um, uh, here on stage uh, to talk a little bit more about um, how to follow the heart in the setting of Becker muscular dystrophy. Um, you can see swallowing difficulty in Becker even um, that precedes some of the significant musculoskeletal weakness. Uh, and so that's something that I'm going to ask about in the setting of uh, uh, someone's Becker dystrophy. The other thing you want to remember, um, 
people with Becker muscular dystrophy are going to have typical, um, uh, typical medical complications, appendicitis, a tooth abscess, the need for some sort of surgical intervention. We want to remember they are still at risk for the, um, the uh, muscle breakdown associated with anesthesia, the inhaled anesthesia, so the high potassium levels uh, uh, that can be associated with certain anesthesia, so you want to continue to think about that. Um, and then the things that are common in the setting of Becker muscular dystrophy, myalgias or muscle uh, achiness, uh, an occasional rhabdomyolysis, that's muscle breakdown that leads to T-colored urine. The myoglobin uh, in the urine can clog up the kidneys and lead to kidney um, uh, injury. And so uh, one of the things that we talk a lot about in the clinic, uh, I ask the, the boys in my clinic or the young men, have you noticed Coca-Cola colored urine or um, uh, iced tea colored urine? Uh, we see it frequently after exertion. So if a child's out on the soccer field or I had a situation where a young man swam a crate across Lake Washington when I was at Seattle Children's Hospital uh, and that led to his presentation, his first presentation of Becker muscular dystrophy. Uh, he developed acute rhabdomyolysis, ended up needing um, uh, 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 renal dialysis uh, short term until his kidneys recovered. So education is something that's really important. Uh, female carriers, uh, it's a higher percent of carriers in the setting of Becker dystrophy than we see in Duchenne. Uh, and so the cardiac monitoring that we do in the setting of Duchenne uh, for women who are carriers, we want to do the same uh, as uh, we would then. And finally, uh, some emerging therapies. Uh, we're fortunate to have a number of speakers this weekend uh, that will be talking about some of the emerging therapies. So we'll hear about EDGE, um, uh, which is a uh, myoprotective uh, and a fast um, uh, myosin uh, uh, fibers. That's an oral agent, vermirolone, which is a steroid-like uh, medication. Um, there's a Becker uh, imaging study uh, that you might hear about as well. And um, you can see there's a session on Friday that I encourage people to um, sit in on. So final thoughts, um, and Rachel, you spoke to this. I think that uh, we need to be thinking and talking and researching more about Becker muscular dystrophy. Um, and I think that uh, this is a great start um, to having folks in this room talking about it. Um, Becker muscular dystrophy could teach us a little bit about the efficacy of some of the various shortened dystrophin proteins. So you heard today Kevin Flanagan talk about um, uh, gene therapy and the use of the mini or microdystrophin genes. The construct of those genes, so hopefully you know this, but the construct of those genes are based on men who are in their 50s who are still ambulatory. They figured out what are the important parts of the dystrophin gene and took the important parts out, threw the out, others out, put that in a viral vector, and now in clinical trials uh, we are understanding the efficacy of those shortened genes. Um, and then finally, um, I think the incidence of, of Becker dystrophy, and I put this in quotes. So the quotes suggest that this idea of um, transitioning someone from Duchenne to Becker with disease-modifying drugs, I also believe that we're going to probably start seeing an increase in the prevalence of Becker through newborn screening. We're actually seeing it in spinal muscular atrophy now. We're seeing very mild phenotypes now that we're doing new newborn screening, and I expect that we'll see the same with Duchenne. And I guess my final words are words from Dr. Smith. I'm um, saying he's really sorry he couldn't be here today. He gave his room number, uh, 4180. Um, <laughs> knock loudly on the door. He may be sleeping because he's a little bit uncomfortable and, or not feeling great. If you have any questions, knock on the door, ask him, slip a note under the, um, the uh, door, and wish him well as well. So uh, <laughs> I'm not going to hand the podium over to you, Nikki. And if you're, if you're not careful. <laughs> He'll come and try to chat with you. Oh, that was great. Oh. Um, yeah, do we want to switch to Claudia or switch slides to Nikki's slides? There we go. There we go. Goes. Thank you. Thanks. So my name is Nikki Armstrong. I'm one of the genetic counselors here at PPMD. And today I'm going to be talking about genetics and family planning. So... Maybe. The big green one. Try, okay. There we go. Okay. I'm not going to spend very much time on this slide because Dr. Abcon already talked to you at length about dystrophinopathies, but um, I do want to, you know, 
start at the very beginning, and that is that Becker is, of course, a problem caused by changes in the gene, the DMD gene, that make dystrophin. And as a result, dystrophin is made in lesser amounts or it's made incorrectly. And when you don't have dystrophin, the muscles aren't able to function properly or repair themselves. So I love this slide. Um, on the left-hand side, we have a picture of the muscle cell membrane. And you can see those ye like yellow beads on a necklace. There is dystrophin, right? And it is really important. It's part of what we call the dystrophin glycoprotein complex. And that complex is necessary for stabling, stabilizing the muscle cell membrane. So when you think about what muscles do every day, they expand and they contract. And that actually is really hard on the muscle cells. So to keep those muscle cells intact, they need things like this to work to stabilize them. Otherwise, over time, that action of muscle cells moving and the expanding and the contracting damages the muscle cell membrane, which is then what causes the damage to the muscles themselves. Those cells, calcium goes into them, and they get damaged, and they die, and that causes the muscle damage. I think of dystrophin as a shock absorber. So that's why you've got the picture on the right. That is our shock absorber, and it's very important. It also serves some other roles in communication and other things between cells, but the shock absorbing is one of the biggest ones. So in order to talk about genetics, we gotta go back to high school biology class. So this is where we're at. Just a reminder, our bodies are made up of cells, lots of different kinds of cells, but inside most of the cells, we have the chromosomes. And the chromosomes are important because they're the way we package our genetic information. So we inherit them from our parents and we pass them on to our children. If you unwind those chromosomes, you get the actual genes. Each gene is just an instruction to make something we need for growth and development. If you unwind the genes, you get to the DNA. So the DNA is the set of chemicals that make up the genes. And those chemicals are the A, C, T's, and G's. They're actually, they work like an alphabet. And all those chemicals are supposed to be arranged in a very specific way that the body then reads to make the protein. So this is what a typical cell in the body looks like underneath the microscope. So each one of those structures is a chromosome. We call the whole set the, the karyotype. Most people have 46 chromosomes total. First 22 pairs are the same in both sexes, and then the last pair determines, determines the birth sex. So typically, uh, most female babies have two Xs at birth, and most male babies have a Y. Uh, if you look at those, those sex chromosomes, you'll see there's a big difference between the X and the Y chromosome. The X chromosome has a lot of genes on it that the Y chromosome does not contain. And that means that females typically have two copies of all the genes on the X chromosome, whereas men only have one because they only have that one X. So as you guys probably already know, Becker is considered an X-linked condition because the DMD gene is located on the X chromosome. So now we're gonna go into a little more detail of the DMD gene itself. So the DMD gene is huge. It's one of the biggest in the human body. And like all genes, it's made up of sections that we call exons and sections we call introns. The exons are the part that actually codes for the protein. And DMD has 79 exons. The introns are those pieces in between. And we used to think these were actually junk, but it turns out they're really important in regulation. But as part of making the protein, what happens, has to happen is you have to remove those exons, and the, excuse me, remove the introns, and then all the exons have to fit back together to make the functional protein. I love this picture because it shows how the exons fit together. And it looks a little bit like the puzzle. So you can see all 79 of them, and they all come into the pieces where they're supposed to be. I've also heard it described as a train car with all the train pieces fitting together. But either way, I think it's a really good demonstration of how the, all the exons fit together. There's lots of different kinds of changes in the DMD gene that can cause Becker or Duchenne. Um, we used to word, use the word mutation, but we've actually sort of started to phase that word out because it has connotations that aren't great. So you'll hear most people now use the term variant. So we've got genetic variants or pathogenic variant. And there's lots of different kinds of pathogenic variants that can cause both Becker and Duchenne. The most common type is what we call a large deletion. Deletion just means a missing section, and large means it's at least one of those exons. Uh, the next most common type of genetic variant are actually sequence changes. And what that means is that there's a change within the, the letters of the DNA. So it's a, at a much smaller level. And then the other most common one are duplications, or large duplications, so where we have an extra copy of an exon. This is my um, demonstration of it. 
if we had a gene as a sentence, so our gene here is a sentence, each word is an exon, and you can see the, the typical functioning gene is the old dog ran too far. We've got a deletion, so we're missing the word dog. We've got a duplication, an extra copy of the word dog. And we've got a nonsense. A, a nonsense variant is also sometimes called a stop variant. And what that is, is where a stop signal is inserted somewhere in the gene uh, before it's actually at the end. So it's like moving the period into the middle of the gene. Uh, a missense variant is where you switch just one little chemical within the gene. And an insertion is where you've got a couple, usually it's a couple of chemicals, sometimes only one, chemicals that are inserted within the gene. Okay, so Dr. Abcon mentioned the reading frame. The reading frame is a way that in genetics we try to understand why um, different genetic changes cause the symptoms that they cause. And one of the things that was noted actually quite a long time ago is that you can have similar size deletions in both Duchenne and Becker. And it's not really about size that matters so much, it matters about how all the pieces fit back together. And so this is explained by what we call the reading frame rule. So our example here is we have our exons, or our sentence, the old dog ran. And you can see all the pieces fit back together, and so we get a protein that's functional and does what it's supposed to do. Now when we have what's called an out of frame deletion, what we have is we've got our missing word, and the remaining pieces don't fit back together. And because they don't fit back together, the protein isn't functional. And usually in those cases, very little or no protein is made. And in, in most cases, an out of frame deletion would then be associated with Duchenne in the person. Now here we've got an in frame deletion. And what you can see here is we still have a, a missing word, but those remaining pieces, they'll fit back together. And because they do fit together, we get a protein. And that protein isn't the full length protein. It's you know, not exactly the same, but it's still a functional protein. And so most cases when we have an in frame deletion, we have Becker. So one of the most common questions I get when I'm talking to families with a newly diagnosed child is, what can you tell from my genetic variant? Does this predict the severity? And we know that usually an outer frame deletion means no dystrophin, and that usually means Duchenne, and usually an in frame deletion means partially functional dystrophin, and that means Becker. But it's important to understand that there are many, many exceptions to the reading frame rule, and it is by no means a perfect association. But it does provide a little bit of information for us. The reading frame rule is also the basis of exon skipping therapies. So I, another common question I get from families is, is whether or not uh, uh, an exon skipping therapy might be an option for their child with Becker. And this is demonstrating kind of how exon skipping therapies work. So you can see on the far left is the typical gene. We got all the exons there, all the pieces fit together. We get our dystrophin that works. In the middle, we have a, a patient who has a deletion of exons 49 and 50. And you can see that that 48 and that 51, they don't fit together. And because they don't fit together, no dystrophin is produced. And then on the far, or on the right side, we have a patient who has exon skipping therapy. So skipping exon 51, you can see how 48 and 52 can come back together. And so then you've got what they, we say, the reading frame is restored. And then the hope is to produce some dystrophin. It's shortened, it's not full length, but it's shortened and, and hopefully functional. So this is why if a person has an in-frame deletion and, and has Becker, exon skipping therapies are not an option because there's, it's already in frame. You can't make it more in frame. So, so now I'm gonna talk a little bit about inheritance. Both Duchenne and Becker are inherited with an X-linked pattern. And there's sort of two different ways, or two different areas to think about. One is uh, if we have a, a woman who is what we call a carrier, uh, again, women have two copies of the X, so then she would have one copy of her DMD gene that has a variant in it, and the other copy is typically functional. When we have kids, we pass on, pass on half of our genes, so she would pass on you know, either the one that has the variant or the one that doesn't. Uh, sex is determined by the sperm, so depending on whether the, the baby inherits the X from the father or the Y from the father de would determine the sex. And you can see there of the, um, the four potential possibilities and kind of what the possible outcomes are. And the, the other scenario is that we have a father who has Becker, and with him, he's either gonna pass on his X that has the variant, or he's gonna pass on his Y. And so there, the, um, there are two 
possibility is it all, essentially all of the girls will be carriers and all of the boys will be unaffected and not carriers. As Dr. Abkhan mentioned, uh, Becker is a little bit different than Duchenne in that if you look at it statistically, about 90% of women who have a son with Becker are carriers. Uh, in Duchenne, it's about two thirds that are carriers, so it's a, it is a little bit different. But about one out of 10 times, a woman who is a mother of a son with Becker who has no family history would not be a carrier. Because of that, we do recommend carrier testing for all women who have a child with Becker. Uh, for her own health, because women who are carriers uh, are at increased risk for a heart condition, cardiomyopathy, and need screening and potential treatment for that. Uh, also for family planning, because if a woman, there's a difference in risk between a woman who is a carrier and a woman who has a child that has a brand new genetic change. And then also knowing for relatives, because if a woman is a carrier, then potentially other family members like her sisters and further out in the family could be carriers. Genetic testing is also incredibly important for people who have Becker. It's now considered the gold standard for diagnosis, uh, and it's useful for other family members having testing. When we test in a family, we actually test for the particular genetic change that was identified in the, the person with the condition first. That makes the testing the most accurate it can be. Um, and in Duchenne, we have variant-specific therapies, and it's certainly possible the same thing will, will happen with Becker in time. PBMD is very proud of our free genetic testing program, Decode Duchenne. It is industry sponsored and we are incredibly thankful for our partners with that. Uh, but we have, are in the, the multiple thousands of individuals who've been tested at this point and it's a really great program. It is available to any male with a confirmed or suspected diagnosis of Duchenne or Becker or any female who has a relative with Duchenne or Becker. And really the, the big criteria either haven't had genetic testing the past genetic testing couldn't find a genetic change, or the past genetic testing wasn't good enough to be able to see where like a deletion or duplication started or ended, and then you have to be a legal resident of the US or Canada. And the testing is done at a standard clinical lab laboratory with all the appropriate certifications. Okay, now I'm gonna switch gears and talk about family planning. And I feel like I should be really honest and say I hate talking about family planning in large groups. And the reason for that is this is such an incredibly personal decision. Um, it's really complicated. Choosing to have kids is very much based on um, your personal experiences, your family experiences, your, your um, values, all those different pieces. So it, it's a complicated discussion. If, um, if this you know, if family planning is important to you, it's important, it's, if at all possible, discussing prior to pregnancy is best. There's additional options to consider before a couple is pregnant. Uh, many of the options in family planning require that the particular genetic variant in the family be known. Uh, and that I am a, a strong advocate for really open and honest discussions with your partner. Uh, I talk to a lot of couples and in many times, um, one member of the couple is far more, con far more uh, familiar with the condition than the other member of the couple. Um, maybe they had a family history, maybe they've lived the experience. Either way, there needs to be a lot of open and honest conversations. And I really um, encourage individualized genetic counseling so that you can talk through the options that are important to you and what's appropriate to you. That being said, I am gonna go through kind of just some of the basics of what's available. Uh, this is a pregnancy timeline, just so they're all on the, on the same wavelength, and I'm going to talk through some of these options. Um, as I mentioned, there are some things that are available prior to conception, so that's why um, thinking about this before becoming pregnant can be really useful. Uh, and then there are different tests that could be considered throughout a pregnancy or potentially after birth. So the first one that I want to mention is called pre-implantation genetic testing, or in the lingo, PGT. Uh, Pre-implantation genetic testing has been around for almost 30 years now, and essentially the process is uh, in vitro fertilization. So you harvest some eggs from mom, collect some sperm from dad, fertilization happens in a petri dish, and then you grow the embryo to a certain number of cells. You take a tiny sample from that embryo that then is tested. Uh, PGTM is uh, the type of PG2 that you do where you look specifically for the genetic variant in the DMD gene. That M stands for monogenic. Uh, PGTA is a very similar process, but instead of looking at the actual gene, you look at the sex chromosomes. So you're looking at the X's or the Y's. The A stands for aneuploid, which just has, means how many chromosomes do we have. Both of these are procedures that are available. Um, 
Because they involve IVF, they are very expensive, uh, not unusual for them to around, run around $20,000 or, or more. Um, and no pregnancy is guaranteed because of the fact that they uh, are an IVF process. So sometimes the embryos, when they are um, returned to the woman, they do not actually implant, and so a pregnancy doesn't result. There are tests that can happen during a pregnancy, like an amniocentesis or a chorionic villus sampling. Uh, there, is, um, there is no treatment available for Becker or Duchenne or, or the vast majority of genetic conditions during a pregnancy, uh, but some families do want to know this information during the pregnancy. Uh, the CVS is done between 10 to 12 weeks of gestation, and essentially a little piece of the placenta is removed and tested. And amniocentesis is done around 14 or 15 weeks or after of her pregnancy, and in that test, they remove a, a small amount of fluid from the sac around the baby. Uh, that includes uh, cells that the baby has shed, skin cells, just like we shed our skin cells. And in both cases, they take those samples back to the laboratory, they grow up the cells, and then they can look for the, the DMD variant or the chromosomes. Uh, those tests take typically about three to four weeks to come back. So in thinking about what could the mother and the couple consider if the mother is a carrier, uh, many couples choose unassisted pregnancy and might think about testing the child after birth to see if the child has the condition. Uh, some couples might consider embryo or infant adoption. Uh, some couples uh, I know of actually have used an egg donor. Um, that could be an unrelated person or it could actually be a screened relative. I, I know of some sisters who've done that. Uh, some couples consider the pre-implantation genetic testing specifically for the DMD variant. In some cases, they actually can't do the pre-implantation genetic testing for the particular variant uh, because it requires some very technical laboratory work. And so I do know some couples that have chosen to do pre-implantation genetic testing to specifically for sex. Um, sometimes people will choose to do cell-free fetal DNA testing. So that's a test where you take some of mom's blood and inside mom's blood are little pieces of the DNA from the placenta and you can actually check for uh, sex chromosomes and, uh, and other chromosome differences, and that can sometimes guide whether additional pregnancy ha testing happens in the pregnancy. So if the couple was um, concerned about having a son with Becker, they might check sex first and then think about testing further in the pregnancy. Uh, and occasionally couples will consider amniocentesis or chorionic villus sampling during the pregnancy. Now, if the, the father has Becker, couples can consider an unassisted pregnancy, uh, embryo or infant adoption, sperm donor, uh, either unre unrelated or screened relative, uh, pre-implantation genetic testing for sex. Uh, there's not really a, a reason in most cases to do it specifically for the DMD variant. That's actually a lot more complicated than just checking for sex. And because of if we know a man has Becker, it, it's really based on what the sex is of the, the fetus or the child. Yeah. Again, cell-free fetal DNA testing can be done for the sex, and then uh, unassisted pregnancy with prenatal testing is an option as well. Uh, ultrasound could be de used for determining sex <coughs> or amniocentesis or chorionic villus sampling. So now I'm switching gears completely. Uh, so the other big role that I have at PPMD is actually working within the Duchenne Registry. And you hopefully are already aware of our registry. We have more than 5,500 people in the registry. We're at 15 years of data this fall and more than 100 countries. And we're, the registry is now an app for your phone, which is amazing because it makes it super easy. Essentially what families do is they download the app and then they complete surveys. And that data that they provide through those surveys we use for research, which is awesome. And I'm, the reason I'm bringing it up today is because we know we have a lack of data on individuals with Becker. We know that given the frequency of Becker, we should have a lot more people with Becker in the registry. We only had 425 participants with Becker in the registry when I checked on Monday, and that is way less than it should be. So I, I would really like to encourage anyone with Becker to join. In order for us to better understand Becker, we have to collect as much data as possible. Uh, and then the other big benefit for you, especially as all these new potential therapies are coming on board, is that we do email you directly if there are any clinical trials that are recruiting that you would be eligible for. So you get specific information to yourself uh, about potential clinical trials. And, oops, I went too far. Okay. There are three genetic counselors that are here at uh, the conference, and we are all available on one-on-one -on -one sessions, or if you're on virtually, you can schedule through our Duchenne Registry webpage and Calendly's. 
uh, for later dates. You can also reach out to us at any point. Um, and again, if you have specific questions, I, I really appreciate, would love you, for you to do that. If you have questions about your particular genetic change or about family planning for your family, we would love to help. Thank you, Nikki. I learned a lot. That what? was awesome. I'm sure we'll have lots of questions for Nikki when we do our Q&A. Uh, next up, we have Dr. Andreas Barth, who is a cardiologist from Kennedy Krieger Institute, who is doing some really cool work in adults with Becker and uh, muscular dystrophies. So I think we're all going to learn a lot from him, too. Thank you very much. Thank you, Rachel. So I want to focus my talk today on cardiac involvement in Becker muscular dystrophy, what is known, and focus specifically on heart failure, and then also arrhythmias. And then on the management, uh, discuss some medications, advanced heart failure therapies, and uh, defibrillators that we use to treat arrhythmias. We've seen a similar slide before, and uh, we heard that dystrophin is like a shock absorber, which I, I love that um, um, analogy. Um, so what it does, it connects actually the, um, here is the sarcomere, that part of the heart that does the, the contraction, and a heart we have about 100,000 heartbeats during the day. So there's a lot of contraction, a lot of stress on, on the heart muscle. And what dystrophin does, it connects this contractile elements, the actin, um, this is dystrophin, to the cell membrane. So to a lot uh, of what's going on outside of uh, the heart muscle cell and there's a lot of signaling going on. So if there's an increased stress on the heart, the dystrophin is able to signal that to the outside membrane. And if that signaling is impaired, like in Becker and Duchenne muscular dystrophy, um, there can be problem with uh, stability of the um, sarcomere and the uh, heart cell in general. So we heard that too, that um, dystrophin has several uh, parts that are important to gene and some that are repetitive. And the actin binding domain, that's the one that links to the contractile elements. At the end, we have several elements that are also unique to the gene, but then there are a lot of repetitive elements. And it's very important if you have a Duchenne muscular dystrophy, you have a shorter gene products and critical elements that are lacking, particularly those at the ends. If you have Becker, you may have all of the critical elements still be present, but some of those repetitive elements are missing. But, so you still get some dystrophin, but it is a little bit shorter and um, less impaired. So with dystrophin, if you look at the protein level, in Duchenne, the protein levels are exceedingly low or actually absent. You have 0 to 5% of dystrophin that is present at the uh, protein level. With Becker, you have about 20 to 50% of dystrophin levels uh, still present. And then there's intermediate phenotype, and you can call that either mild uh, Duchenne or severe Becker, it's somewhere in, in the middle. And I wanna highlight three patients from my clinic who have Becker muscular dystrophy and highlight the presentation that can be highly variable in those patients. The first one, and that's probably the most common patient who I see, is a 32-year-old man who had progressive muscle weakness at the age of 21. Cardiac MRI at that time showed a reduced heart function and we categorize that by this ejection fraction. The heart is a pump, and how much blood does the heart pump out with every heartbeat? It's usually never 100%. It's about 55 to 60% of the blood that's in the heart chamber that's it pumped out, and then it mixes with new blood, and again, 55 to 60% is pumped out. We call this the ejection fraction. In his case, the ejection fraction, or EF, dropped to um, 20%. Sorry. Uh, dropped to 20%, and uh, there was actually presence of fibrosis, so scar tissue in the heart. And with medications, which I'm going to discuss in, in a little bit, his heart, this ejection fraction improved from 20% to 30 to 35%. He also got a defibrillator, because we know when the ejection fraction is less than 35%, there's a higher risk of the heart to become electrically unstable. And by the age of uh, 32, he was in a motorized wheelchair. So there was definitely skeletal muscle involvement, but he also had cardiac involvement. And both were about equal in, in this case. And now this is another patient who is a 28-year-old man with <coughs> mild to moderate proximal muscle weakness. He was still able to work in a packaging facility. And interestingly, his cardiac MRI showed that his 
ejection fraction was normal, and there was no scar. So when you compare it to the last patient, he definitely had skeletal muscle involvement, but very little with respect to cardiac involvement. So it was very asymmetrical. Now this is the third patient, 52-year-old man. He worked in home remodeling all his life, exercised at the gym twice a week, had no problems whatsoever. And then at the age of 40, he was diagnosed with an arrhythmia and then was found to have cardiomyopathy, so weakening of his heart muscle. And that actually, despite optimal medical therapy, it progressed to the point that he required a heart transplant at the age of 49. And then somebody sort of was, um, was asking the question, why does this patient have um, this non-ischemic cardiomyopathy? And he underwent genetic testing after he had this heart transplant. And they found that he had a genetic variant that was consistent with Becker muscular dystrophy. And this is when the patient was then referred to, uh, to see me. And interestingly, he went to the gym, worked in home remodeling, so heavy labor, um, did not have any skeletal muscle weakness whatsoever. But his CK, which is a marker of um, a muscle degradation product, was elevated and um, up to two to three times the upper limit of normal. So when you look at him, the skeletal muscle symptoms were very mild, and he had predominant cardiac involvement and required a cardiac transplant. And I have two patients um, that follow that pattern. And so when you look at the variable presentation in Becker muscular dystrophy, patient one, equal amount of skeletal and cardiac involvement. Patient two had predominantly skeletal muscle involvement and patient three had mostly cardiac involvement. It's important to know that the heart is a muscle too. It's not the same as skeletal muscle, but you can definitely have um, involvement of the heart muscle in uh, Becker muscular dystrophy. And there are several patients that have been described in the literature where the first manifestation of Becker muscular dystrophy was the heart, was the, the heart failure that presented. And there are six patients that are presented in this article. And again, I have two patients in my clinic that follow the same pattern. Now, how do we follow those patients? So it is very important that those patients undergo cardiac imaging. I told you that this ejection fraction is by far the most important parameter that we follow. And you can do two things. You can look with echocardiogram, which is an ultrasound exam of the heart, or you can do cardiac MRIs. The cardiac MRIs have one additional advantage in addition to the echocardiogram is that you can A, get better images, but B, you can also look at the amount of scar tissue in the heart. And we know that in Duchenne and Becker, there is a lot of scar tissue that gradually forms over the period of years uh, or decades. And it's important to take that into account and you see that with cardiac MRIs. Usually I recommend for patients to have cardiac MRIs every three to five years, and in between, they should have echocardiograms on a yearly basis. In this study, they looked at 20 patients with uh, Duchenne and 68 with Becker muscular dystrophy. Uh, on average, they were 20 or 30 years old. They all underwent cardiac MRIs and then were followed for an average of four years afterwards. And they looked which patients do actually require hospitalizations for heart failure, which patients develop those dangerous life-threatening arrhythmias, which we call ventricular tachycardia, and who actually had a cardiac death or required a heart transplant. And this is one important figure from that article. And it correlates on one axis, on the x-axis, the left ventricular ejection fraction is EF. So the higher, the better. And on the y-axis, you see the LGE, which is the scar on the cardiac MRI. And what you can see is that the more scar you have, the lower your ejection fraction. And that's really a, an inverse correlation. So patients who have a high ejection fraction, very few of them have, have scar. And the more scar you develop, the lower your ejection fraction will, uh, will become. And then they've said, well, what about outcome? How do these two parameters, the ejection fraction and the scar matter? And no surprise is those patients who have an ejection fraction greater than 45%, they did much better than those patients who had an ejection fraction than less than 45%. Now, the ejection fraction is not the full story. Here they not only accounted for the ejection fraction, but they also looked at the scar tissue. So, 
on top, the patients that did best were those patients with an ejection fraction of greater than 45% and no scar on cardiac MRI. The patients that did worse were the patients where the ejection fraction was slow and there was scar tissue on the cardiac MRI. And interestingly, those patients that had an ejection fraction more, greater than 45%, but they had scar, they actually didn't do so well. So it tells you that the ejection fraction alone is just an imperfect marker, and you really need to take into account not only the ejection fraction, but also uh, the amount of scar tissue that's present in the heart. So how do we manage those patients? I told you that it's very important that those patients undergo cardiac imaging on a at least yearly basis, alternating between echocardiograms and cardiac MRIs. Patients with Becker, they reach really 40, 50, 60 years old. So they can become older. So it's important that we manage all cardiovascular risk factors um, very aggressively because we know that if you have a tendency to develop a weak heart and then you have long-standing hypertension or you have diabetes or sleep apnea or smoking or high cholesterol, all those will predispose you to develop some forms of acquired heart disease. And if you add those forms of acquired heart disease to a genetic form of heart disease, you can make the form of genetic heart disease much worse. So managing their and optimizing their cardiovascular risks is very, very important. Then when it comes to what do we do when the, the heart function declines? So Guideline-directed medical therapies indicated in patients with Becker muscular dystrophy when the left ventricular ejection fraction of less than 45% uh, is present. And now the current guidelines, which are from this year, also state that there is no data regarding the prophylactic initiation of an ACE inhibitor or another medication that we usually give to treat patients who have symptomatic heart failure um, before cardiac dysfunction, so before they develop um, cardiomyopathy. Now, I'm making, a, hopefully, a strong point that if we know that this patient has Becker muscular dystrophy and there is scar tissue present, I would definitely start those medications at an earlier age. And management of Becker muscular dystrophy is extrapolated from the Shen muscular dystrophy data given the shared pathological uh, mechanisms. But there's really a paucity of data in the literature when it comes to how early should we start treatment in patients with Becker muscular dystrophy and are there any specific therapies that really aim at dystrophin? So when we think about medications um, that we give to patients who have a reduced ejection fraction, so this ejection fraction normally is 55 to 60. If it drops below 40%, we call this heart failure with reduced ejection fraction. And it's important to know that there are four pillars of treatment. And it's like an army that's fighting a battle. You don't want only to have your Air Force. You want also the, the Navy and um, um, Army to be there. So everyone, you, you attack the heart failure from various different angles. And this is the same with medications. So it's not a single medication that is useful, but there are four different medications that are important. The mainstay are what we call ACE inhibitors, or that's lisinopril, common in the United States, or angiotensin receptor blockers, losartan, or the newest kid on the block that is actually the most effective one is entresto, or we call those ARNIs. Um, those medications are incredibly effective, and there's good data in Duchenne muscular dystrophy that even prophylactic administration of ACE inhibitors at a stage when cardiac dysfunction is not present really helps to delay the progression of the disease and push it out into the future, hopefully, for many, many years. The second medication class are beta blockers. This is metoprolol or covedilol. Those are medications that block the effect of adrenaline on the heart. The third ones are so-called MRAs. They block the effect of um, aldosterone on the heart. And the fourth ones are medications that were initially developed to treat diabetes. We call those SGLT2 inhibitors. And what we found is that patients who have diabetes and heart failure, their heart failure improved. And then the next question was, well, if it works for heart failure, does it also work for heart failure for patients who don't have diabetes? And lo and behold, yes. The answer is a clear yes there. 
So it is important when you have a patient who has an ejection fraction of less than 40%, they need to be ideally on all four medications. So what about treating patients at a pre-symptomatic stage? So if you have left ventricular fibrosis on cardiac MRI, this is where the cardiac MRI is so important, I would argue that putting patients on an ACE inhibitor is very important because we know that can slow the progression of the disease. Likewise, if you have hypertension, so if you have high blood pressure, if you have diabetes, you should strongly consider um, an ACE inhibitor in that setting because it has a dual function. Not only does it treat the hypertension, but it also helps to keep the heart strong. What about beta blockers in a pre-symptomatic stage? Beta blockers blunt the effect of adrenaline on the heart, and they're very effective uh, if you have arrhythmias. So if you have arrhythmias at a pre-symptomatic stage, I would strongly consider a beta blocker. MRAs are important if you have left ventricular fibrosis. And last, um, the SGLT2 inhibitors, if you have diabetes mellitus, you should also consider that at a pre-symptomatic stage. And importantly, all those four medications, if you can put a patient on all those four, you not only improve the heart failure, but you improve survival. There are other medications that have been shown to be very effective if you have symptoms of heart failure, but they don't necessarily improve survival. One of them is uh, diuretics, so our water pills, if you have swelling of your feet or if you retain water in your lungs, they're very important to reduce symptoms, but they haven't been shown to have the same benefit as those four main classes that I uh, listed here. And it's important if you are on one medication, you reduce the risk of complications by 32%. If you manage to have a patient who has heart failure with reduced ejection fractions on two medications, you reduce the risk of complications by 44%. If you're on a triple therapy, it's 55% risk reduction. And if you add this SGLT2 inhibitor, so that's diabetes medicine, you can add another 25% on top of triple therapy. So it tells you that it's really important to attack the heart failure from multiple angles with four medications. One medication is good, but it's not good enough. So what do we do if patients, despite optimal medical therapy, progress? and uh, we can't really stabilize the heart fu function, or they're not able to tolerate uh, medications. We can send the patients home on what we call inotrope uh, therapy. So we give them a medication like adrenaline via continuous infusion pump to strengthen the heart muscle. This is a very, um, a therapy that hasn't really been shown to improve survival. It helps in the short term, but they are those are the patients where we think about left ventricular assist devices or heart transplantation. And left ventricular assist devices are little pumps that are implanted. And in heart failure, um, what you see here, this is the left main pumping chamber. That's the heart pump uh, chamber that pumps the blood through the body. And if this chamber gets weak, you can put in this pump and there is an inflow cannula that sucks the blood out of the, this heart chamber and pumps it into the aorta, into the main um, vessel of the body, and can thereby support the heart function. And they need to be implanted. There is, they need battery power. There is a drive line that goes to a, um, a little computer, and you carry the batteries with you at all times. Now, you think that this is a rather aggressive therapy, and yes, it is, but this is reserved for patients who are otherwise wouldn't, are very sick, they would have a one-year survival of less than 50%. And if you start with those uh, newer devices, they have actually an, a quite a good prognosis. At, at uh, two years, 75% uh, of patients are, are still alive. And actually, this is something that is very similar to what you get with heart transplants. So this left ventricular assist devices nowadays are nearly at the same level of, as, as heart transplantation. And when, will we con when we would, uh, would we consider this? If you have frequent hospitalizations for heart failure, if you need more of those water pills to manage the, uh, the swelling of the leg or um, the, the fluid in the lungs, if you have uh, inability to tolerate guideline-directed medical therapy, so if I'm not able to start a patient on ACE inhibitors or beta blocker, or over time I even have to 
cut back on those medications because of low blood pressure, which indicates that the heart function is really low. If you're really dependent on inotropes, on adrenaline, to keep the blood pressure up. Or if you have uh, end organ dysfunction attributed to low cardiac output, if there is so little blood that the perfusion of the kidneys uh, or, or the liver is impaired. And you really want to start to think about those uh, advanced heart failure therapies, as we call them, uh, early. Because if you develop irreversible either liver, pulmonary, or renal disease, then you the horses are out of the barn and it may be very hard to, to reverse that process. And other contraindications for this advanced heart failure therapies, uh, if you have non-adherence to medical um, uh, therapy, if you are obesity, if you have an active infection, and also that's a relative contraindication if you have musculoskeletal uh, disease that uh, impairs rehabilitation. Now you could say that this is true basically for all patients who have uh, Becker muscular dystrophy. But as I showed initially, it can be very asymmetric. You can have predominant cardiac dysfunction with very little um, skeletal muscle involvement. And those patients may very well qualify for uh, advanced heart failure therapies. In fact, I would say that this is a rather weak contraindication. What really drives the discussion with the cardiac surgeon whether a patient is eligible for those advanced heart failure therapy is the pulmonary status. How good is their lung function? That really largely determines whether they are candidates or not. And last, I want to briefly uh, discuss the risk of arrhythmias in Becker muscular dystrophy. And this was a little uh, small study that was done on Holter monitors for 91 patients with Duchenne and 64 Holters from 21 patients with Becker muscular dystrophy. And interestingly, what this patient, uh, what, what this study found was that patients who have Becker muscular dystrophy had twice the rate of um, arrhythmias compared to Duchenne patients. And this is also what I see in clinic, that if you remain ambulatory for longer and if you have heart disease, it takes you considerably more effort to transfer out of chair to the, to the bed. And that increased effort translates into increased amount of adrenaline, and that adrenaline can certainly contribute to some of the arrhythmias that uh, we, we see. And if patients have cardiomyopathy with an ejection fraction of less than 35%, we know that this not only leads to mechanical instability of the heart, but you're also more likely to develop electrical instability of the heart that can lead to life-threatening arrhythmias. And we can treat not the life-threatening arrhythmias, but we can prevent patients from dying from those life-threatening arrhythmias by implanting defibrillators. We call this implantable cardioverters defibrillators. Those are little, it's a computer with a battery that's implanted, and usually there's a lead that's threaded, it's, it's an insulated wire that's threaded through a vein, goes all the way into the heart, and um, it can monitor the heartbeat 24 seven. If you have a normal heartbeat, the device won't do anything, but if you ever should go into a dangerous life-threatening arrhythmia that doesn't terminate on its own, the device will be able to recognize that and either try to pace you out of that. If that's not successful, then you would get a shock. It's what you see in the movies where they put the paddles on the chest and, and shock you. This is what this implantable cardioverter defibrillator does. It's essentially having EMS with you at 24 for seven. Now, it's, you would ask why not put that in, in every patient? It's a rather aggressive therapy, can be life-saving, but there are also a lot of complications associated with this th uh, therapy. Um, those leads can unfortunately break over time. There can be recalls with the battery over time. Um, there, there are surgical complications associated with implantation of the devices. And more importantly, you could get a shock when you don't need one. It's a computer with a battery that can malfunction. They can mistake a rhythm that is otherwise benign and you can get a shock when you're awake and that can be very painful. Um, so you need to discuss all those pros and the cons uh, with the patients. So when do we implant those devices? The current guidelines uh, say, well, if you have had already a dangerous life-threatening arrhythmia and you were fortunate enough to survive this, we don't ask any further questions, you should really get that. Uh, you should get an ICD. And importantly, you see that Duchenne, Becker, and limb girdle muscular dystrophy type 2, they're all lumped together in the guidelines. It tells you that there is just really no data on Becker muscular dystrophy specifically. 
what about implanting a defibrillator prophylactically? So in a patient who never had any arrhythmias, but we know that they're higher risk. Well, that can be considered as a class 2A indication. So not quite as strong as uh, if you have a class 1 indication after having a dangerous arrhythmia. And the only criteria is actually when your ejection fraction is less than 35%. And we know that this is really not enough. As I told you before, the scar tissue really matters in that case. If the more scar you have, the more likely it is that your ejection fraction drops. But even if your ejection fraction is relatively preserved, the more scar you have, the more arrhythmias. So this is a, a meta-analysis where they pooled data from multiple studies, not Duchenne, not Becker, but other forms of non-ischemic cardiomyopathies that are similar to Duchenne and Becker. And, and they looked, what is the correlation between the amount of scar tissue and arrhythmias? And if there was no correlation, it would be all on this line. If you had more scar and less arrhythmias, it would be all here. But if the more scar tissue you have, the more arrhythmias, it would point towards that direction. And you can see that everything is above, is, is to the right of the, the line of, with, with one. So every single study that was done shows the more scar you have in your heart, the more likely it is that you get one of those dangerous arrhythmias. So we really should not underestimate the amount of scar that's, that's in the heart. And this is why we look carefully with cardiac MRIs at the scar tissue and the ejection fraction at the same time. So just to summarize, there is no direct correlation in uh, Becker muscular dystrophy between cardiac and skeletal muscle involvement. In fact, it can be very, um, uh, um, very asymmetrical. The cardiac care by a specialized provider who is familiar with patients with Duchenne and also with Becker muscular dystrophy is really a must. And medical therapies aiming to preserve and restore normal heart function are the most important. And that's actually, as a cardiac electrophysiologist, a physician who focuses on arrhythmias, the mainstay is really to keep the heart healthy. If you keep the heart healthy, if you keep the heart strong, that will keep arrhythmias away for a long time. And if you progress, uh, if the heart gets weaker over time, despite guideline-directed medical therapy, consideration to advanced heart failure therapies should be given. So you should work very closely with a team, specialized team of providers who have access to either this left ventricular assist devices or to cardiac transplantation in Becker muscular dystrophy. And in order to treat those dangerous arrhythmias, ICD implantation should be considered if the left ventricular ejection fraction is less than 35%. And we also take into account, account the presence of SCAR on cardiac MRI as this can increase your risk of arrhythmias. So thank you for, for your attention. I'm happy to take your questions afterwards. Thank you so much, Dr. Burr. Oh man, that was good stuff. I'm sure you all have lots of questions. Make sure you write them down so that you don't forget. And if you are listening online, go ahead and throw them in the chat and we'll be sure to get to them um, after this last presentation from Claudia Senesak, who's gonna talk about physical therapy considerations in Becker muscular dystrophy. All right, the big green button. I yes. so. <laughs> it is the big green hope button. hope so. Okay, so I'm going to uh, wrap this up talking about exercise. So exercise is really important. And when I say exercise, I'm really talking about movement. And um, before you start exercising, what are the really important things that you need to know before you start exercising? Some people just jump right into it. And if you have Becker muscular dystrophy, that might not be the best thing for you. So how do you get a good start? And what are the things that you should focus on if you're going to be exercising? There's a lot of evidence out there, and it's, it's pretty well understood that if you're not moving, if you're not exercising at all, then that's going to lead to atrophy of your muscles. Um, let's see if this is what I think it is. <laughs> Yay. Um, these are MRI images up here of the upper arm. This is the biceps. This is the triceps. And this is in someone that has Becker muscular dystrophy. And there is quite a bit of atrophy here of the muscles. This is just subcutaneous fat here. So just something to think about as we go forward. 
So what are the things that you need to know first? So one of the questions that I often ask patients that I have is what you know about your body. Do you have limitations? What are those limitations? Do you have range of motion limitations? Do you have contractures? Do you have certain joints that don't extend all the way? Are you able to maybe straighten your knee all the way? Do you have tightness at your ankle? What are those things that um, limit you from moving? Do you have pain? Uh, where is that pain? What's the intensity of that pain? And I'll talk more about that as we get into it. Do you have balance issues? Have you fallen? Are you falling frequently? Do you get tired easily? Are you fatigued throughout the day? Um, and what are the things that make you tired? And then do you get winded when you're exerting yourself? And exertion is going to vary depending on how involved you are, how involved your um, progression is with the disease. So how do you get started? What's really one of the first things you should do? You should really check with your doctor before you start an exercise program. It's really the safest thing to do. You want to know if there are any contraindications to exercising. Have you had fractures in the past? Have you had any dislocations? Do your shoulders sort of slip in and out of the joint? Um, do you have looseness around your hips? Are there precautions? Are you osteoporotic? Do you have heart issues? And we just heard a lot about the heart, and it it's not uncommon, as you heard, for people with BMD to have cardiac issues. So we're going to want to know if you have cardiac issues and what those are, and will that interfere with exercising? And what are those precautions we need to take when you are exercising? Are there respiratory or pulmonary concerns that we need to be aware of when you're exercising? And then get a referral to a physical therapist. And it would be ideal if the physical therapist had uh, some experience with BMD. But just to be honest with you, there aren't very many physical therapists out there that are familiar with BMD. So if that's your situation, if you go out and you go to a physical therapy clinic and there isn't a physical therapist, that is familiar with BMD, and this is the case often with Duchenne as well, then you can also reach back to PPMD, and they will get you in contact with someone that has experience, and that person will contact the therapist that you're working with and set up a dialogue. So what does that physical therapy assessment or evaluation look like, or what should it include? So this is for your information, as well as for therapists that might be in the room. There should be a good history. Um, we want to know what your progression has looked like over the years. We also want to know um, what your range of motion is like. So typically, we're going to do some measurements to find out where are you tight? Do you have contractures? What do those look like? What are those measurements like? What about strength? What is your strength like? And maybe that person does what's called a manual muscle test. Maybe they don't do that. But they should be asking you questions about what are your weakest muscles? Where do you feel like you are the weakest? And what are your strongest muscles? What areas of your body are the strongest? What about pain? There are some um, pain measures out there. We, they should be asking you, where is your pain? 
What's the intensity of your pain on a scale from one to 10? And I, I always ask people when I'm, when I'm asking this question, I, I'll say to them, 10, someone cut your arm off. Okay, like that's really intense. And one is, I can deal with this. This is no big deal. I hardly even notice it. If I'm sitting down and somebody bumps my toe, then I'm like, oh yeah, that hurts. So there's a scale to that. What activity brings your pain on? And even more importantly, what relieves your pain? Is there a certain position you get into that is comfortable and takes away the pain that you have, or at least decreases the pain that you have? What are your routines during the day? What are the functional things that you do during the day? Whether you're in a wheelchair or whether you're still walking, what are those things that happen during the day, like a day in your life? Everybody has routines. You get up in the morning, maybe you go out and you sit down, you read the newspaper, or maybe you have to have something to eat right away. Maybe you have to have a cup of coffee right away. We want to know what that looks like. And also, embedded in that, what do your transfers look like? Are you able to get up by yourself and move from one piece of furniture to another piece of furniture? And if so, what does it look like? Can you get up from a couch? Can you get up from maybe the chair, the chairs that we have in this room? Some people will tell you, I can't get up from a low chair. I'm going to need assistance with that. But once I'm up, I'm fine. I can walk. Or someone might say, I can get up from the chair, but I'm going to do it. It's going to look a little bit different. I'm going to turn around. I'm going to face the chair. I'm going to lean over. I'm going to push up on that piece of furniture. I might lock my knees out. I might really spread my feet apart really wide to do it, but I can do it by myself. We need to know that information. That's going to be critical information for us. What about activities of daily living? The things that come under that category are going to be things like, can you feed yourself? Can you drink from a cup? Can it be a regular size cup? Can you drink a soda out of a can? Do you drink from a straw? What about bathing and dressing, toileting, brushing your teeth, grooming, those kinds of things? Those are all things that can be adapted. If you're not able to do them by yourself, those are activities that we can adapt for you. How's your balance? Again, going back to are you falling? Have you fallen recently? What caused that fall? Did you trip on a throw rug? Did you just weren't able to pick your feet up enough and you just were dragging your toes? We need to know that information. Balance is something we can work on in therapy and can make a difference. What about walking? What is your gait pattern like? How do you walk from room to room? And if you're walking, are you using a cane? Do you use maybe a walker? Uh, and what is your endurance like? I've talked to a lot of men with Becker muscular dystrophy, and when you ask them if they're walking, and they say yes, if you don't ask the follow-up questions, they won't tell you that, well, I'm only walking in the house, and I'm only walking a few steps from the couch to the next piece of furniture. So we have to ask those questions, and we want you to feel free to tell us what those answers are. And then we want to know if you have equipment. Do you have a wheelchair? What kind of chair is it? Um, do you have a cane? Do you have any type of assistive devices? Do you wear any type of bracing? It could just be a shoe insert. 
um, but we want to know what that is. Are you on any type of non-invasive ventilation? That tells us something about your lung function. It also tells us a little bit about your endurance. And then anything else that, um, that you think is important. This is before we actually get to the exercise. <laughs> it's coming. All right, so what is best for you? And that's going to depend on what your needs are. But there is some research out there that says isometric exercise is a good exercise. It is the least damaging of the contractions that your muscles can do. And basically, the muscle is contracting to hold you in a particular position, and the muscle fibers are not moving once the position is reached. So it's the least damaging. And this is one of the examples I always use to explain that. If I put my arms together and I'm pushing them together, this is an isometric exercise. My muscles are not lengthening and shortening during this contraction. So it's the least damaging. Um, versus something like an eccentric contraction where I would be walking down those stairs where my muscles would have to lengthen as they're going down the stairs. And that takes a lot of control and a lot of strength to do that. And that's probably the most difficult contraction we make, but it's also can be the most damaging to our muscle fibers and to the, to the uh, cell membrane around the muscle fibers. When we do isometric exercises and when I'm instructing someone with either uh, BMD or Duchenne, I'm going to um, ask them to repeat this exercise for, or to hold this exercise for a very short period of time for only maybe three to five seconds. And then I'm going to have them repeat it for six repetitions. And then I might ask them to do it in three different positions. So for instance, if I'm going to have them do something with their biceps, I might have them do it right here. That might be the first position. I might have them just start with no weight at all. And I'm going to repeat that six times. I'm only going to hold it for three or five seconds. The next position might be here. Same thing. And then the third position might be there. So I've changed the angle of the muscle each time. Um, and so you know, the, the example that I just gave was hold the curl versus doing this kind of exercise repetitive shortening and lengthening of biceps and triceps, which would be more damaging to the muscle. And um, Dr. Lott at the University of Florida did a, a nice study. Uh, into, it was published in 2021 in Muscle and Nerve. And he did this in um, boys with Duchenne. And it showed that, and it was you know, a much younger population, but it showed through MRI and through um, a lot of other measures that there was no damage to the muscle during this type of exercise. And other studies have shown that isometric exercise is um, safe in terms of not damaging the muscle. So we still have a lot of research to do. It hasn't, we don't have a study in Becker muscular dystrophy, and we still need to study Duchenne a lot more. All right, other exercise programs that are good in this population would be getting on a recumbent stationary bike, no resistance, OK? Resistance means you have to work harder, which means your muscle has to work harder. And we just don't know the results of that yet. Um, we know that when you put more effort in, that it strains the cell membrane. And that's where we have problems. That's where dystrophin comes in. So the nice thing about the recumbent bikes is that you have nice back support. 
You can adjust the seat so that you get just at the right angle, and it monitors your heart rate while you're on there. So that's a nice little feature. This is an arm cycler. This just sets up on a countertop. Um, and you want to make sure that it's very stable, that it's not going to slide as you're trying to use your arm cycling. Again, no resistance. And um, it will on this, it's not measuring your heart rate, but it will measure the number of reps that you do. Those are both good exercises. And then other activities to consider. So balance skills in standing and sitting. So you can work on balance if you're in a wheelchair. You can work on balance sitting on a mat table. You can work on balance in standing. And this is a really good exercise because um, it's really, there's no resistance involved here. It's using small perturbations, so just a little bit of a challenge to your balance. Can you regain your balance and come back to the midline? Catching and tossing uh, lightweight balls or lightweight sandbags, no weighted balls. So you don't want a heavy ball, but you can change the size of the ball, the texture of the ball, um, and still keep it lightweight using targeting games like uh, cornhole, <laughs> um, any other type of targeting game. Swimming is fantastic because you're in the water, the buoyancy of the water relieves some of the uh, stress of gravity on your muscles. You can be walking in the pool, you can be swimming in the pool, you can um, hold on to a kickboard, or a raft and be working on your legs as you're in the pool. Bowling is a good activity. There's adaptive bowling at a regular bowling alley. Even if you're in a wheelchair, you can wheel up. They have a ramp that um, you, the ball is set on and you can bowl that way. Or you can get the regular size pins, but they're lightweight plastic pins and work on bowling, which again is another targeting skill. Um, you can do this in standing and sitting. And again, it's going to work on your trunk. And it's going to work on targeting skills and balance. Yoga is great because it works on relaxation. And it also works on breathing and stretching. So stretching is good. Uh, it doesn't have to be a big routine of stretching. It doesn't have to be every day. You want it to fit into your routine. Um, stretching is mobility. And you're just taking the joint through its available range. It increases circulation to the joint. It's relaxing. Um, it makes you feel good when you're able to stretch out. Breathing exercises are fantastic. Um, pursed lip breathing, where you just take in a deep breath, and you blow it out through your lips. It tends to create a back pressure in your lungs and open up some of those terminal sacs. If your posture isn't very good and you're sitting like this, you're closing off some of your, your lung, and so you're not getting in a deep breath very often, so that's a good way to get that in there. Stacked breathing is taking these short inhalations and stacking one on top of the other. So it sounds a little bit like this. It's a good way to relax, and it also gets air in there without taking that big breath in, which is sometimes hard for people. And then huffing is a way to clear the back part of your throat. So, and that just sounds like this. Sound effects by Claudia. <laughs> and it just, it creates in the back of your throat like a little umbrella. The soft palate back there rises up and it clears mucus from the back of your throat. So when I'm seeing patients, I'll often say, do this after you've eaten, 
because a lot of times food and mucus kind of collects in the back of your throat, so that can just kind of clear that for you. And then you're gonna love this. Daily routines, things you do all the time require movement, and that counts as exercise. So cooking, maybe you don't do a lot of cooking, but maybe you could be the sous chef. Maybe you could help get things out of the refrigerator, help get things prepared. Gardening counts as an exercise. Um, love this one, lighthouse work, okay? Everybody loves this. <laughs> Not, but we still have to do some of it, and that counts as exercise. Art, music, maybe play an instrument. Um, art is actually an exercise, and it's creative. And then positioning. Um, one of the adults that I see will take a rest two times a day. And what he does is he does it in sideline and he gets positioned. He has a little bit of help to get the positioning done. But he does it so that he's stretching while he's in sideline. And he takes a short nap in that position. And then he gets a stretch while he's doing it at the same time. So just passing it along. All right, here are the takeaways. So exercise. It may improve your strength, isometric exercise. It helps to decrease pain. Moving helps decrease pain. It may decrease depression because moving makes you feel better. It makes you mentally feel better and it makes your body feel good. It improves mobility because there is a lot of research that says if you just sit in one position all the time for all day, you're gonna get tight. So it improves mobility, it improves circulation, lots of research on this, may improve your balance, that's a good thing may help with relaxation. Oh, I love that. Everybody is stressed out these days. Helps with positioning. Oh, this is a bonus. It may improve your sleep. Everybody needs a restful night's sleep. And that's it. See how easy that was? You just need to move more. Thank you, Claudia. And I know that we'll hear more from Claudia's team tomorrow during the Becker research session as well. So at this time, we've got a little bit of time left. Let's open it up for questions. Ellen, did we have any come in online? We did not, but okay. I have a question if I can ask my question. Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> Oh. <laughs> oh, I'm looking at them. I'm like, what do you think? <laughs> so both of you get to answer that question. <laughs> Well, my answer is, I have no idea. <laughs> it's kind of interesting to It's very interesting. And um, there's a researcher at, um, uh, in Pittsburgh that might actually be looking at that. Roxana Ben Dixon, Dr. Roxana Ben Dixon. And, um, so I think we need to follow up on that. Sue, do you have some thoughts? Yeah, Ellen, I was going to say, um, Eric Henriksen, um, who works with, uh, he is a colleague of Craig McDonald at UC Davis, is doing a lot of really interesting work looking at mobile technology, the wearables. Um, mm -hmm. And I think that we are going to hear some really interesting results from his work uh, over the coming years. So you may want to bump into him uh, over the next three days, because I know he's here. He is here. 
What other questions? If you could, if you could come up to the mic, if you're able to, that would certainly be helpful. And if not, I can have Ellen maybe help run the, run the mic. Okay, so my wife and I had three girls. Turns out all of them are carriers. The oldest one rolled the dice, had one boy with Duchenne, one boy without. Second girl is a manifesting carrier. She's been in a wheelchair since about age 22, so the Becker was of particular interest here. Uh, third one, uh, she's will be 33 next month, and so the clock is ticking louder and louder. And she and her husband are looking at doing the IVF. But like most things over the years, when you say, do you have any expertise in muscular dystrophy? The answer is what? So are there any clinics or doctors doing IVF who actually know something about muscular dystrophy? Yeah, so I'm guessing that with the IVF, they're gonna do the testing on the embryo, the pre-implantation yeah. genetic testing. Right. Yeah, um, there are essentially like three big main laboratories within the U.S. where they send those embryo samples. There actually aren't very many laboratories that can do that kind of testing. Um, some of them have more experience than others with particular types of variants. So it actually has to do with the kind of genetic change that's in your family because they do deletions and duplications differently than they do sequence variants on that embryo testing. Um, but that's a, actually a question that it, if, if she wanted to reach out to us, I can help direct her to the laboratories that I know other families have used. We'd be okay. happy to make those connections. Great. Thank you. You're welcome. Oh, and also, all of the stuff you've been talking about, about Becker, to what extent does this apply to a female manifesting carrier? I'm going to look at you, Dr. Apcon. <laughs> Um, well, I think a lot of what you're hearing, I think, is very applicable to someone um, who is manifesting. It sounds like your daughter is uh, now wheelchair dependent. Yes. And so the, the things that Claudia talked about in terms of exercise, I think, is very re relevant. The things that Dr. Bart talked about in terms of cardiac care, very relevant. Um, and even the use of things like corticosteroids have been used uh, much less commonly. Um, but uh, have been used in women with a dystrophin. Yeah, she's been in Duplazicorp for yeah. 15 years now. Yeah. This is a, a really important priority for PPMD, too. Um, earlier this year, we launched a carrier pilot clinic, so a multidisciplinary clinic targeted for women who are carriers that have symptoms. And um, we have a team member whose uh, primary role is the development of carrier-related resources and programming. So um, we're just getting started on this. There's a lot of work left to do, but I think that over the next couple of years, there's going to be a lot of movement in this space. And so definitely keep your ears to the ground on that one and reach out to us so that we can make sure that you're plugged in. Yeah, several years ago, PPMD hosted um, mm -hmm. a carrier um, conference, and I had the privilege of joining a bunch of people from around the country, actually internationally, um, where there was a very broad discussion, um, everything from basic science um, uh, to uh, cardiac care was a big emphasis, uh, genetic testing was another emphasis, uh, and then some treatment-related um, uh, discussions. And so. Um, I'd be happy to share that publication. Uh, it actually resulted in a publication. Uh, and uh, you or your family uh, or the providers, the, the physicians or care providers for your daughters um, may find it interesting as well. Okay, thanks. Great question, thank you. Hi, thanks for the presentations and your ex expertise. Uh, my son is actually, he has DMD, not BMD, but uh, what I understand about BMD is that there's a lot of variability. Like, you know, you have people who are walking, let's say, up to in their 20s to, you know, some of them are walking up to 60s. So what I wanted to get some sort of, like, feedback on is how do you uh, make clinical decisions when, you know, you're dealing with a patient population that is that varied? And the reason that I ask is he also, he participated in a gene therapy trial. So he has, I mean, although it's not BMD, but he has some form of dystrophin now. So we are trying to make those decisions around, for example, like steroids, right? So BMD, I, as, I, as I understand, not all patients 
are treated with steroids. Some of them are treated with weekend or uh, daily. So, like, what do you sort of like? What do you keep in mind to make those decisions when it comes to BMD patients and how it might apply to, like? Uh, yeah, it's a wonderful question. I can I can talk about it from the standpoint of being a neuromuscular provider, um, and then you know we have the expertise of others. Um, you know, every child who comes into our clinic setting, I view them as an individual child, young adult or, or adult, um, and so I'm looking to see who's in front of me um, and listening to the history, um, doing a good physical examination utilizing the results of the formal testing that our physical therapy colleagues are doing. So they're doing standardized testing, and I'm tracking that over time. If I see a progression in someone who has what we see genetically as a Becker-type dystrophy, um, but they are having a progression that is more characteristic of someone with a more severe type, um, at that point, I might consider the use of corticosteroids as an example. Mm -hmm. I'm a rehab physician by training, and so I'm going to think about equipment needs. So regardless of whether they have Duchenne or Becker or where they fall along the spectrum, if a child is having limitations in their activity, a family is making decisions about going to the park or the zoo or to the to the course field, which is where I'm from Colorado, so the baseball team plays at course field. If they're making a decision to go or not to go based on the child's physical abilities, I'm gonna start thinking about equipment. If they're not gonna go to the zoo because the child's too tired or the father's or mother's back is too sore to carry that child, then it's an opportunity to introduce some sort of equipment. Um, um, and Claudia, I'd love to hear your 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 take on the the exercise piece. Um, uh, yeah, I, when it comes to the exercise, it's it's not one size fits all. It it really has to be individualized, and it has to be what fits in your routine. Mm -hmm. And you heard me come back to routines a lot in this. It's really hard to get people to exercise that have really busy schedules. So it has to be something that's reasonable with the routines that you have um, so that it fits your lifestyle. It doesn't make sense to, um, to give you things that, number one, we know might not, that probably won't work and number two, that reason, aren't reasonable for any family to do, whether they had a child with Duchenne or not. Thank you. From a cardiac perspective, it doesn't make a difference whether you're Duchenne or Becker. Really, what, they're all under this umbrella of dystrenopathies, so you really should have the same approach with respect to screening. They should get see a provider who has experience with cardiac care in these patients. You should do the regular screening, echo and cardiac MRIs, particularly the cardiac MRIs, and then based on that, you decide. But whether it's a Becker or Duchenne, from that perspective, it doesn't really matter. It's mostly what do we find, and you need the, the expertise uh, to manage that. Thank you. Thank you. Questions? Claudia, this is primarily for you. Um, I'm a physical therapist, but my brother also has Becker. And his big issue is neck pain. And I don't get a lot, I mean, I, from the pediatric clinic, we don't get a lot of that that I hear of that gets to me. Um, but with him, he is six foot two. <laughs> <laughs> and there's just a lot of shoulder there, you know, a lot of arm. And I have tried just about everything from massage to taping. And I wasn't sure if you had done anything in the past or have heard anything along those lines to kind of help with that particular pain. Um, so are you trying to treat him yourself? <laughs> yes and no. <laughs> well, tell, her what tell her what your clinical background is, though. <laughs> Give yourself some credit. What? Oh, I... What do you mean? She's in a neuromuscular clinic. Yeah. Oh, I'm, okay. I'm, yeah, I'm the, I'm the WashU clinic. Okay. <laughs> okay. So have 
you assessed like his cervical spine to not in a while okay so he probably needs to, I mean, you probably need to look at, you know, his alignment of his cervical spine to see if he's out of alignment and then to see what his scapula and his shoulder girdle are doing. Like more of an ortho, and take the, the B and D out for a minute and look at it as an orthopedic problem and then add that back in if that makes sense to you. And I'd be happy to talk to you when we're done. That might be fun. <laughs> and I would, add, I would add an ergonomic assessment, right? So at totally. six foot two, I don't know what your brother does for fun or for a vocation, but depending on you know, what he's doing, if he's down here or up here, that probably contributing as well. I know it is probably for everyone up on this uh, podium right now um, uh, who's doing Zoom 24 seven. Um, so that's just another. Thing to think about. Um, maybe you should tell everyone how to sign up for the one-on-one -on -one session. I was going to end with that, but you know what? Since you brought it up now, that's perfect, Anessa. Thank you. So we have one-on-one -on -one appointment opportunities for you all. So whether it's for yourself or for your brother or for your child. So Nikki and her colleagues, Anne and Kayla, our other two genetic counselors, are they're available for one-on-one -on -one genetic counseling appointments the entire week. So if you've got questions about genetics, if you've got questions about pre-implantation genetics, family planning, all of that good stuff, go into your Cvent app on your phone. Um, and heck, if that's too hard, we'll figure it out. We'll, we'll do it old school on paper. <laughs> Don't tell on me. Um, but we can get you that time scheduled so that you can ask these questions that are going to be specific to you and your family and your circumstances. And then same for Claudia. So Claudia is here with four PT students from UF, and she and her students are available for one-on-one -on -one consults. If you've got questions about pain or positioning or exercise or anything that she talked about today, Get her ear, grab her ear, talk through these things. Um, they're brilliant. We are going to very kindly and appreciatively use and abuse them. Uh, we also have a respiratory therapist who's doing one-on-one -on -one appointments as well, and then we have somebody else who's doing uh, learning and behavior appointments. So please, please, please use Nikki, use Claudia. They're brilliant. We know it. You know it. Have them answer your personal questions. Do we have any other questions today? All right, well then that was the perfect way to end. Can you add one more thing? Yeah. Please come to our resource fair, our vendor fair, and both your favorite nice hack poster. Okay, resource fair and vendor fair. That's where the food is. So that's where you want to go. So definitely so, go. So definitely go there. Um, it's just out in that big main open area. When you come out here, you, you can't miss it. Um, we have those night hat posters, which are really, really cool. Uh, it's the first time that we've done that. It's a really awesome opportunity for the community to kind of contribute their ideas and life hacks. So check those out. Vote on them. There's a really fun game if you want to go through um, what I missed that, Ellen. I'm sorry. Oh, you vote through Cvent. So if you should already have the Cvent app on your phone. So you can vote for your favorite night hack through Cvent. And then there's even a fun game for the kids to, or if you want to play the game, uh, to go around and you get like tokens from each of the vendors. And then once you've gotten a token from each one, you get a prize. So <laughs> thank you so much for joining us, everybody. Have a great rest of your night. We'll see you at the vendor fair.